Hi, welcome to the Best Life, Best Death podcast. I'm Diane Hullett, and today I'm here with a special guest, Jean Zimmerman. Jean and I met through a mutual friend, and um, I think his story is just one that's really powerful in terms of a journey through grief and a journey into healing when he lost his wife some years back. Uh, welcome, Jean. Thanks, Diane. Nice to be with you. So Jean is a businessman uh, turned surprise poet. And I think, you know, he found his way into the power of language through this experience of grief. You can find out more about Jean's book on a website called snowcapconsulting.com. And Jean, the book that he ultimately wrote is called Searching for Clarity. Tell us, Jean, how this kind of even came about that you found yourself writing poems. I typically, um, in my past, had not studied poetry or really had been exposed to it too much. But when my uh, late wife's illness, um, which which ended up going for five years, uh, came about, there's you know I was uh, in the home video industry, something that we used to have called video stores, um, which was a which was a great time frame. But uh, right at the end of that industry, um, she became ill, and as I became her care giver and then um, basically uh, as she transitioned on the last two years into needing full-time care you know I became her full-time advocate and companion and um, she had a tumor in her spinal cord so there was a lot of unknown we never knew what was going to happen or when and as the signals travel up the spinal cord going to the brain or from the brain down through the spinal cord the signals don't go around the tumor, they just don't go. So it starts to shut down different body functions and capabilities. And so it was in the fourth year of, of that situation that, that sort of the uh, amount of pressure that, that was pushing, just kind of pushed the poetry out of me, which was something that was unexpected and uh, something that I continued to, to follow and became a great relief in terms of being able to express how things were feeling, where things were going, and to, you know, spend more reflective time instead of just complete stress time or, you know, just a, and there's so much of a negative aspect that can happen when you're dealing with death, when you're dealing with uh, the overwhelming emotion that comes with a lot of things that are not in your control anymore. So, so this became a very positive way to uh, spend time with that to start to understand what was happening, what was probably going to happen and, and deal with it from there. Yeah. It's like in the midst of this terrible diagnosis that didn't have a clear structure or path to it. Like you were just waiting constantly for the next, um, loss in how her body was working. Right. Then you found this really kind of creative way to, keep moving for yourself in, in a way that I think was kind of a surprise to you. As you said, you weren't a poet in the past. Right. So it was Jean, a complete surprise. Gene's yeah. going to read um, three of his poems for us um, on the podcast today. And I don't know, is there any more background you want to give Gene before reading the first one? I think that pretty much sets the narrative. And uh, so I can, uh, I can start with the first poem in the, uh, and it, I think the first poem feeds right into what we were just talking about. It's, it's titled uh, Death's Door. And essentially, it's, it's really about noticing things are changed. Things, things are beyond our control now. And uh, so here it is, Death's Door. One day, as I strode by, Death's dark door cracked open. I didn't like what I saw or felt for now in my life, it dwelt. Wait, this can't be. She will get better, you'll see. If only this were in the cards. Once the door opens, the tracking begins. Not that it came often, but visits were made. Invitations to visit the door, hard to put off and ignore. As hope begins to sink, there is no way but to realize Life will never again get to be a happy, long-living reality. Beautiful. So that really speaks to sort of uh, coming to terms. 
How how long after her diagnosis was that? The that I wrote this poem. I didn't start writing uh, poetry until four years after her diagnosis. So I would say it was probably about four and a half years. That is when I wrote that. Yeah. And that seems like that's such a big piece of, um, you know, this kind of an experience is the coming to terms. And it's not like a one-time event, right? It's like a right. coming to terms over and over and each day and each um, loss of a different kind of piece of the body not working. Right. It's, uh, it's such a uh, different experience. And I've had friends that have had sudden deaths happen to them. And a sudden death is so totally opposite of the five-year illness and then death that my late wife went through. Because in the period of the five years, you do have time to learn to come to grips with grief, to recognize what loss will be. Um, and in a sudden death, it's just so overwhelming because you've had no time to prepare. prepare. You've had no idea it was going to happen. And then suddenly it's the person is gone. And, uh, right, both extremely hard, but in some ways the slower is more preparation for those who live on, more right. time to, to be with that truth, yeah. Right, yeah. What other, what other ways did you kind of find yourself coping with that, with that unknown? You talked about the unknown of this illness being such a, such a difficult part of it. Right, and that, Truly, um, th besides the writing, it was literally a lot of walking, um, searching out nature, you know, living in a city, you know, you have a limited access to nature, but, uh, but parks, um, quiet spaces helped a lot, you know, just being, being outdoors when you sequester inside you, you were in such a shutdown type mode. And being outside, hearing kids laughing, hearing birds sing, feeling the sun on your face, the breeze uh, makes such a difference. Such a difference, yeah. Not to be not to be underestimated at all. Right. I think it's interesting too that that this creative piece, um, you know, comes through for people in different ways. And I think we are so language based that sometimes for people it is writing, whether that's poetry or narratives or a journal. Or uh, I know one friend with breast cancer kept a, a book that was almost like a rage journal. I mean, it's this incredible art piece because it's drawings and scribbles and collages and journal writing. And the whole book itself is like this three-dimensional um, you know, piece that held her experience of that time when she was going through chemo and radiation in a way that I think nothing else kind of held it for her. It was right. like, People couldn't meet her the way her own creativity could meet her. Right. And what a great outpouring instead of holding that in. And I think that's one of the biggest difficulties is how you hold something in, which is not typically healthy, versus how do you let it out? What do you, right. what do you use to look at it with? And right, right. Like what's, what can we, what, what, how, how what can we use to help ourselves um, almost like integrate or um, process this experience we're going through? And honestly, actually, I just said rage journal. I don't know, this friend might call it a gratitude journal, right? Because right. it's so intertwined. Right. And she could alternately, you know, use them back yeah. and forth. It may one not page. be just one thing, you know, yeah, exactly. depending on what time she's looking at it. Yeah. So. Does the second poem seem to fit here? I think it does because the second poem now speaks to certainly, you know, we just talked about writing as a creative aspect, uh, being out in nature as being a calming aspect. Uh, but, you know, certainly one of the biggest aspects in, in a death or a situation where, where you're really struggling and overwhelmed is the reach out and help that family and friends give. And this poem really speaks to uh, someone who recognized what was going on. And the name of the poem is You Knew. I don't suppose you will ever know how deep and far I've fallen. There was no asking or telling, but you knew I wasn't quite right. As the weeks, months, and years mounted, your constant presence and concern 
counted. Days where I wasn't together or connected, you gave precious relief and in introspection. So much continual confusion and complexity. It just won't stop. It keeps getting worse. Worn to the point of ragged, nerves are worked until completely broken. Staggering through the days, stumbling and falling. My biggest job was to get up to face another day. Made much more possible by your kindness and caring. Beautiful, yeah. How, mu how much we're social animals and how difficult it is sometimes to reach out when you're in the middle of grief, you almost need other people to reach towards. And I, I talk to friends sometimes who say, you know, I just don't know what to say. And I always feel like, well, just say anything. Like right. just, just a kindness of saying, I'm here for you it is, is the right thing. It doesn't have to be more than that. Yeah, there is an awkwardness um, that happens. And, you know, you find different reactions to this level of, of uh, physical challenge or uh, the death overall in that, that some people you would expect are, would completely be there maybe aren't, and some people you would never expect to be there, maybe are. But, uh, but the awkwardness was something that, you know, I've talked with people because I've felt it myself with other people and people felt it in my late wife's situation. And then it truly is exactly what you said. It's just don't get into that mind game. You know, just, just, just talk, just say, you know, even though how are you is kind of a, <laughs> That's not really the, the way to launch into one of those conversations, but, um, but it is, it is just don't make it more complicated. Just, yeah. Don't make it more complicated. Show up for people. Yeah. Yeah. In whatever small or large ways you can. I, I also sometimes have heard people say just the consistency of showing up can be important. It isn't always that um, the friend or the family member can be there with constancy, um, right. but just not dropping off the planet when six more months have gone by, two more years have gone by. In your case, five years, it's a long time. Right. I think there's also something about couples, isn't there? Like when you're, when you're a long time couple and you have friends who are long time couples, it's, I've, I've heard it say people almost react like it's contagious. Like they don't know quite what to do when the couple is no longer a couple. Right. That's painful. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different aspects where, you know, people will say, what can we do? Well, when you're really in the throes of this kind of challenge, you have no idea what can they do. It's not like it's top of mind to, oh, could you rake my leaves or, oh, could you make a meal or, oh, my dog needs its hair trimmed or, you know, any number of a million things that probably could be helpful, but you're just not in that. You're not in the ability to to delegate to, and to kind to of be organized and act as the manager. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 What, yeah do you, so, what do you suggest then? Well, I, what I found most helpful was, and the same point would be probably most hard for me to actually come up with, but I did see it be really effective was where people just did something. They just saw something that was like the lawn was too long. So they just mowed it, you know, something like that, you know, right. It, it uh, it, while it is helpful, it's hard for people in the throes of this to figure out what needs to be done and, and tell somebody, this is what I need. Yeah, so kind of maybe maybe you would say, don't, don't hang back and wait for the direction from the grieving or the, right. um, the person in the thick of it, just sort of pitch in, yeah. Right, yeah. and be patient with the awkwardness. It yeah. is awkward, it's awkward on both sides. That's yeah. okay, you know. Yeah. It doesn't yeah, have to be, as in the title, it doesn't have to have clarity. <laughs> Yeah, you're searching for clarity. Right. It doesn't have yeah. to have clarity. Right. Beautiful. What What else would you say about how this creativity, this act of writing poetry moved you through this experience? It gave me a, it gave me such a different space to be in. One that I, I didn't know how to anticipate or it showed up and I was moved to do it. So it, took away the, rather than having large stretches of time where I just, I didn't want to listen to music. I didn't want to watch TV. I didn't, 
I've just done a walk or, you know, it gave me in periods of, of sort of silence and time, it filled that. And then it started to, you know, I started to really feel better, feel like, wow, this is something I want to continue to be um, doing and I want to grow it. So it's really something to, it's something to, um, there's something powerful about expressing something and moving it. Um, like I, I feel it like I'm, I'm seeing Sanskrit right now is like this metaphor of like a river, you know, it's like you, you don't want to be stuck in an eddy, even with such a right. difficult circumstance, you want to, right. you want to find a way to move with it, whatever that movement is for you, whatever way that comes through, whether it's conversation or nature or creativity and whatever your move to do helps to move and integrate and keep healing through this really difficult experience. Right. Because in this, what I really came to find, I was living at death in this with my late wife. I wasn't living a life because we weren't doing things that when you're alive, you do. We were doing things that, that shut down, pull back. You're out of the flow, sort of to your river analogy. Uh, when you're in the flow with family and friends and kids, you're, you're active, you're connective, and when you're in this kind of disease level, you're not, you're trying to survive. And, and that whole survivability mentality is a whole lot different than living. Yeah, so. yeah. Why don't you read us the final poem that you've chosen? Gene, um, Gene and I talked about, you know, that he'd find a few poems to share and so. Yeah, and this is the final poem in the book and it speaks to the, the poems in this particular book go up into my wife's passing, but don't go beyond it. So this is the final poem and it really is a reflective piece. So it's called A Different Place. You helped me to a different place beyond where I could ever go on my own and alone. Doesn't mean it was all smoothness and light. Overall though, priceless is the right word. Extensions of life unlocked and opened up. I would never give back or redo. The life mystery of why am I here seemed to get filled out. While not completely finished, that part needed to be there. I will never forget you, and who knows when I may join you. No one has a schedule of time left, what to put in it. Thank you so much, Jean, for sharing your heart and your poetry with us today. I'm Diane Hullett, and you can find out more about the work I do at bestlifebestdeath.com. And again, Gene Zimmerman sharing from his book, Searching for Clarity. Thanks, Gene. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Gene. That, I feel like these come from such a deep place. Yeah, I, uh, at this point, I look at uh, death really as the pencil sharpener of life because it, it, it makes you see what living is. And today you are alive. And at some point you won't be. We don't know when that is. You know, life has many possibilities. Death has two, how and when. So again, the, the pencil sharpener analogy is if you look at death, it really, you have to see life when you look at death. Yeah, so true. So true. I love it. That's, wow. We should just keep talking. I'll just leave recording on. <laughs> ah, the pencil sharpener of life. That's good. That's really good. Yeah, that probably will make it into a poem someday. It hasn't yet made it into one, but well, you know what? I've always said that um, marriage is like sandpaper, right? And not everybody likes that, but that's sort of how I experience it. It's like, you know, your partner is bound to sort of rub on your rough edges. Like that's what right. they do. Right. And um, this idea that somehow it's going to be simple and, you know, a perfect match and you're going to think the same about everything. So I mean, that's what, when young people say to me, like, wow, what's this, you know, how's, how do, how is 33 years of marriage working for you? I'm like, it is sandpaper every day, baby. Right, but right. what else are we here for than to be rubbed smooth? So I think of that about the yeah. pencil sharpener of death. It's like it, it, it gives this point, this clarity, this intensity that's, 
you know, right. the real deal. Yeah, and, and like your sandpaper analogy, it's rough, it's abrasive, but ultimately it yields a smooth product. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I, I think we got sold a bill of goods or something that said this was all going to be smooth, you know? And in fact, it's if, when you just kind of say, life is rough, life is hard, relationship isn't easy, and then you embrace that. I just think there's such um, joy in that for me. Right. Right. Weird yeah, as that the, sounds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, what, you know, one of the poems I read had the last line was, life will never again get to be the happy, long living reality. But really, to your point, whoever said it would be, or that right. you ever had any, is really what should be, you know, a joyful experience that, right. uh, that some happened, not that it would always be that. Right. And then you've done this incredible, you know, you just, it's, I don't know, it's like you, you went through the tunnel and you embrace the tunnel. Like, I think when we go through those spaces and we don't allow them to make us bitter, I'm always so touched by that because I, I think that a fair number of people end up kind of broken and bitter. Oh, absolutely. So how do you go through, how do you go through whatever hard thing life throws, you know, death, disease, aging, pain and and not come out bitter is i'm just really moved by that right right we, and we don't have a lot of good yeah. examples for it you know right yeah yeah it's a, it's a you'd like to think it's a choice not everything's a choice some people become bitter not because they chose to it's because that's the circumstances that happened to them but they didn't know how to not be bitter yeah. um, other people handle certain situations and handle them well but they get too many in a row and they just can't and it breaks them down yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and and again i think there's something about this skew of like i don't know i, I definitely have some romantic notion of some earlier period in human history where we had elders who kind of showed us how to do this and i'm sure even then there were people who you know did it with grace and people who did it with um, collapse and calamity and, you know. Right, right. And I think you're speaking of ritual a lot there. And mm -hmm. I think modern society, we've gotten away from a lot of ritual. It's not like there isn't ritual if you want to participate, but we just don't have the access where at one point a village or a community would have had an expectation for you to show up to the ritual, to be yes. part of it, to experience it, where in today's world, we don't have to do that. Yes. And I think, and, and, and there's the don't have to, and the, then there's also like the overlay of like COVID, like can't like this. I just, I think people have really struggled with these, um, you know, so many COVID deaths happening separated from family and loved ones, and then not even an ability to have a funeral or, or then like, I've heard at least three situations where friends got COVID by going to a funeral wow. you know, a year sure. after COVID. So, you know, even even this like most sacred of um, rituals becomes this kind of um, I don't know uh, what's the word I'm looking for um, gamut of obstacles to to right. get to and you drive to the funeral instead of flying to the funeral and then you get COVID when you come home you know it's right. just like, holy smokes how did this how did how did we come to be here yeah, yeah that is a special kind of hell that I didn't have to participate in because COVID wasn't around when uh, she passed away yeah. but it's uh unfathomable to me how how you would do that with with someone being in a hospital and you can't go see them yeah someone passing away and you can't have a service so yeah. one of the few rituals as a society that we still do is a funeral yeah and then even that's suspended like you're saying through covid yeah, so really tough very tough a lot of, um, uh, uh, what's the word? A lot of um, grieving that didn't get to happen. What's, what's that word like? Blah. Unprocessed? Yeah, unprocessed. I could only think of the word like retarded, but that's not what I mean. But but like retarded in the sense of like re held back, you know, in right. unable to unable to do the ritual that we have typically done. Yeah. Right, right. And those rituals have power for a reason. We could we scorn do. them, any number of them, whatever they are, take your pick. But the funny thing is, if you go participate in them, there's usually a feeling that comes that you can't get unless you do the ritual. I'm one of these crazy people that um, I kind of love funerals, actually. I'm not so crazy that I go to funerals of people I don't know. 
but you're well <laughs> suited for what you are doing. <laughs> but I, I always get huge life lessons out of going to funerals, yeah. right? I always come yeah. away with this like inspiration for living differently. Right. From and something see, I've heard. That's where death focuses your life. You realize you're alive. Yeah. You haven't passed away. You yeah. have options. You have tomorrow, at least hopefully. Yeah. So. Yeah. Beautiful. Gosh, I'm trying to think what introduction we could put on this second half to talk about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's worth trying to do that. Let's try it. Let me throw one in. Maybe we'll have two podcasts out of this. Okay. Okay. Here's what I'll, here's how I'd introduce the second part. Oops. I would say, um, I would say, let's see. Hi, I'm Diane with Best Life, Best Death. And I'm talking today again with Gene Zimmerman. Gene is a businessman and a poet who wrote a beautiful book called Searching for Clarity. And Gene and I spoke a while back and um, he read three poems from his book. And, you know, we went on to talk more about how he and I perceive sort of grief and ritual and funerals and how those fit in in this time of COVID. Um, hi again, Gene. Good morning, Diane. Great to see you again. I guess we were starting with this idea. We were talking about, um, you know, I, I made the comment that marriage is like sandpaper. And um, now that doesn't fit. We were talking about metaphors that shape us as people. And I, um, I love the way that we have bounced around on those. Right. With the, uh, I had talked about life, uh, death being the pencil sharpener. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Death being the pencil sharpener. So good. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, so many people fear it. So many people uh, spend so much of their lives worrying about it, yet you have no idea when it's going to happen. So, so why not look at it as something that we know it's constant. We know it's going to happen to everybody. So if you look at it, like say it's a pencil sharpener, a way, a lens almost to look through to see, Hey, uh, life is precious. There's a lot of bad things that happen all day, every day. There's a lot of bad things that happen over a person's lifetime. But yet if you use death as the pencil sharpener to see that life is an amazing thing, it's a much better way to move forward than fearing it when you don't know what's going to happen or when anyway. I saw a great quote the other day, a colleague of mine who's a end of life hospice doula in um, the Bay Area. She said, um, you know, it's not going to happen any sooner just because you talked about it. Right. Yeah, exactly. I thought, oh, that's interesting because there is some kind of sometimes mystical thinking, you know, like, oh, what if, but if I talk about it, it acknowledges it. But as far as I can tell, acknowledging our mortality just really brings us into a sharper focus with what we love and who we love. Right. Yeah, it has for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope you keep writing. Have you been writing since your first book? I have, yes. I, it's, you know, it came on so suddenly. I was powerfully moved to do it, but I've often wondered, well, is this just going to disappear as suddenly as it came on? And I'm happy to report six years later, no, it, it hasn't. And not only that, but I have more of a connection to it, of course, than when it first started. And it's a, a process that I totally welcome and is part of my life now and foresee that it will continue to be. Beautiful. I love this sense that we don't always know, like we don't always know how creativity wants to move through us in some way. I mean, this may sound strange, but like, I used to paint a lot. I was a, a just a huge process painter and I loved it. And I taught this work and I painted and painted and painted. And all of a sudden, one day I found myself sewing and I, I just, it was like this, such a change. Like if you had said to me, oh, you'll be doing, you'll be sewing three years from now. I would have been like, are you kidding me? No way will I be sewing. Like that's like yeah. all persnickety and perfect and doesn't sound very interesting to me. And then I just have been sewing for about 10 years nonstop. Wow. It's like my main yeah. creative passion. And, That's um, and then last spring, I did some writing with a friend and I was like, oh yeah, writing, this is so amazing. So it's just really neat when we open ourselves to what 
creative genre has to offer us. And I don't think it has anything to do with skill or talent, or I'm not an artist. It's just, what do you feel moved to do? Are you carving? Are you gardening? Are you building in some way? What do you like to make? There's something so beautiful about our hands and our minds working together. Yeah, that was uh, the pressure of uh, Claire's illness really brought my brought the writing to forefront and to what you're saying I wouldn't have done that by a joy place uh, because had the pressure not been as big as it was I would have just ignored it like I don't write poetry <laughs> you know I'm not going to do that why would I do that but the pressure that I was under pushed it out and yeah. short of that pressure I doubt I ever would have done it so. Yeah, and some people that pressure they crack, right? As we were saying, they 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 become yeah. more bitter, or they become more angry or f- frustrated. So how do you know, if possible, when possible, keep our humanity by moving with um, words or color or whatever makes us find light in the midst right. of challenging times. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Gene. It's great to have an update. And um, yes. We'll see how this all comes together. Thanks and keep writing and let us know what your next book title is. I will. Thanks, Diane. Thank you.